As we are entering 2016, um, this is likely to be one of the most momentous years in Ukraine's post-Soviet history as an independent state. It's actually fortuitous that this is the year that Ukraine celebrates 25 years of independence because the, this year, as already some commentators have, have stated, for example, in a very good piece recently in Bloomberg, that Ukraine and Russia will cement their divorce this year um, as a consequence of which uh, Ukraine will um, part its way with the Soviet past and with uh, Putin's Eurasian Union. Many factors are at work here. Um, in particular, of course, the, the sacrifices made by many people during the Euromaidan revolution, people who died and were uh, suffered repression in various forms and torture and kidnapping, um, and also the tremendous work made by various groups in Ukrainian civil society, patriots on the front line and elsewhere, who managed to thwart Putin's invasion of eastern Ukraine um, in the spring of and summer of 2014. Uh, so what we have starting on January 1st is going into effect the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. This is one of three elements with, within which Ukraine has um, agreed to integrate into Europe as part of the Eastern Partnership. Remember, this was the agreement that um, Viktor Yanukovych dropped um, after he was bribed by Vladimir Putin, and which led to the Euromaidan revolution. The three elements are a political um, document called the Association Agreement, which outlines the various forms of democratization um, and improving the rule of law and justice system, fighting corruption inside Ukraine. Then we have more on the socio-economic fiscal side, which is part of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, which came into effect on the 1st of January. And then later this year, uh, Ukrainians will benefit from the visa-free regime, which will be implemented between Ukraine and the European Union. So all of these elements together um, are a major step towards Ukraine reintegrating into the European political, cultural and spiritual space. Um, Ironically, Ukraine's been helped in this by Putin's um, immature and, um, and arrogant and chauvinistic attitudes towards Ukraine, um, by, in his eyes, punishing Ukraine by curtailing trade, by, by preventing gas supplies to Ukraine. Ukraine is actually pushed further away from Russia. So all of Russia's actions beginning with the invasion, beginning with the annexation of the Crimea, and now ending with the, um, the economic and financial uh, sanctions implemented by Russia, all have the opposite effect to what Putin would like. Ukraine's not going to come back to Russia on its bended knees and somehow beg forgiveness and say, please take us back. In fact, what's happening is that Putin is helping Ukraine's European integration and pushing Ukraine away. Um, and this is one of the many ironies of the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. But it's not unusual in history where conflicts and wars, unfortunately they lead to destruction and loss of life, but they also lead to the forging of new national identities. And we've certainly seen that in the manner in which Ukraine's large number of Russian speakers rallied to Kiev's side, not to Putin's side. So 2016 will be a major breakthrough for Ukraine, not just in terms of economics and people being able to move around, but remember psychologically, and that's very important. Once you've made that psychological break, you're not going to go back to the bad old ways of reintegrating with Putin, Eurasian Union, CIS and such like. It's over. Thank you, Vlad for helping us along in that path. So, 2016, the 25th anniversary of Ukrainian independence, will be remembered by many people, historians and others, who will say that, um, and this has, by the way, already been talked about by Russians. 
that uh, uh, in, in Moscow, Russian journalists who are independent, at least, of Putin, who are saying that the Ukrainian-Russian divorce is happening, and it's happening in particular this year. Um, I think there are a lot of other fortuitous events for Ukraine in the foreign policy domain. In a year's time, we'll have a new U.S. president, and that U.S. president, whether it's Democrat or Republican, um, it doesn't matter, I think, from Ukraine's point of view, because um, either one will be more critical of Russia and more willing to abide by the demands of the U.S. Congress, both houses and both parties, uh, to send defensive military equipment to Ukraine. So the Obama fear factor of not doing that, of thwarting that, will be gone in a year's time. So in January 2017, the new U.S. president will be far more on Ukraine's side. And this is a time when Ukraine, for the first time in 25 years, has been forced to invest a huge amount of resources, limited in Ukraine, of course, um, into its uh, army and national guard. And that that's very important as well. And of course, once the US starts doing that, then other countries, we hope, uh, Britain, Poland, uh, Baltic states, many of the co- and Canada, many of the countries which are actually already training Ukrainian forces will probably also send uh, defensive military equipment. One of those, by the way, is Turkey. Turkey is helping to train Ukraine's um, um, one of the seven countries helping to train Ukraine's armed forces. And that Turkish um, uh, or reorientation away from Russia to Ukraine is now going full speed ahead. Again, thanks to Putin's stupidity. Um, yes, a pilot was lost, but it was Putin that sent these pilots to Syria. It wasn't the Syrians who went to Russia. Um, and um, because of that, Putin escalated the conflict I demanded an apology, which is rather facetious of him and hypocritical, since when has he given an apology for 298 civilians who were killed and murdered on MH17? Um, but Turkey, which under the Islamicist rulers has kind of reoriented it away from Ukraine and Europe towards more, kind of towards more and more Russia, will now be reorientating back towards the Ataturk Kemalist more anti-Russian stance and and because Turkey knows it needs NATO in its conflict with uh, with Russia and that will inevitably be good for the Crimean Tatars and good for Ukraine. So again that's a good development um, uh, from Ukraine's point of view and we've already seen that and I think that will grow. Uh, Turkey and Ukraine will cultivate their relations. And on, on the foreign policy domain, besides the US, EU, Turkey, um, I think we also will see Russia's growing problems. Ukraine in 2016 uh, is predicted to start or resume its economic growth after two to three years of economic recession, bankruptcy initiated by the corrupt and incompetent Nikolai Azarov government under Yanukovych. Um, so as Ukraine's growing, out of its recession, Russia is still stuck in its quagmire of economic recession. It's still suffering heavily from from um, from sanctions and, of course, from low oil prices. Because Russia is, after all, a petrol mafia state. It's totally reliant um, on oil and gas exports. Now, again, Putin shot himself in the foot by sending his forces in to support Assad in Syria. He's made every Sunni Muslim in the world his enemy. Um, And the Sunnis, as we know, like the Saudis, control the oil price or heavily influential over the oil price. So he's not going to get an oil price increase now that he's gone to support um, Assad, who's a sworn enemy of the Sunni Muslims, especially at a time when that conflict between Shiites and Sunnis is growing, as we saw this week with the expulsion of, um, of um, and breakdown of diplomatic relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and Russia is clearly in the Iranian camp. So again, that's good for, from the viewpoint of Ukraine. To me, Russia today re- very much resembles Brezhnevite uh, Soviet Union in the 1980s, a country that doesn't want to accept that it's a declining great power, and, and it's in stagnation. It doesn't have the resources which it would like to introduce 
steps into that sort of expansionist foreign policy uh, imperialism, and yet um, it's still doing that, and in, and in that way it's undermining its own standard of living at home at a time of collapsing raw material prices, as in the 80s, um, and that will inevitably turn the population uh, against Putin, and they'll begin to wake up from their, their slumber, which has been induced by this drug of Russian TV to blame everything on the West, on Ukrainian fascists, on NATO, on America, and elsewhere, when the real blame is on Putin and his criminal, corrupt cronies. And, and to, to say to, to what degree they are criminal can be seen from a recent report released by the Spaniards, a very long, extensive report divulging the extent of ties between organized crime and mafia in Spain and the Putin leadership. So we are really dealing with a mafia petrol state in, in Russia. So all of those, I think all of those areas um, look very good from Ukraine's point of view on the foreign policy and international um, relations viewpoint. Um, I don't see how uh, Putin can retake the advantage here um, in Ukraine. Where I see problems arising is more on the question of President Petro Poroshenko coming to increasingly resemble Viktor Yushchenko. Um, in his third year, which would have been 2007, uh, after the Orange Revolution, and now in Poroshenko's third year after the Euromaidan. Let's be frank, and I have an article coming out this week in Foreign Affairs which argues this. Petro Poroshenko is not interested in fighting oligarchs. He's not interested in fighting high-level corruption um, of his former um, political allies. He was a member of the Azarov government or his current business allies. And he's not interested even in putting people in jail from the Yanukovych regime and those who murdered and protesters and who stole billions from Ukraine and bankers of the country. On the second anniversary of the Euromaidan, it is disgusting to note that not a single person has gone to jail or been criminally convicted for those murders and for that massive wholesale theft in Ukraine. And the person responsible for this is President Poroshenko, not Prime Minister Yatsenyuk. I'm not giving him a break, but under the Constitution, whether it's presidential or parliamentarian in Ukraine, the two institutions that are geared towards fighting high-level corruption and high-level abuse of office are the Prosecutor General's Office and the Security Service of Ukraine. And both of those come under the president's jurisdiction. So it's not the government. And unfortunately, what we have in Ukraine is massive growing disenchantment with the authorities and growing radicalization. At a time when you have an, um, a large number of weapons available in the country, um, I was just in Ukraine and I was told that it used to cost $800 to buy a Kalashnikov automatic rifle. It now costs $200. There are so many around. The bullets you get free, or as somebody said to me, you can get the bullets for a bottle of vodka. Um, also, the threshold for violence has gone down because people were murdered on the Euromaidan and lots of people were died fighting in the East. So death, Ukraines have broken through that psychological barrier of bloodshed and death. Um, now, what we have is something like 80% of Ukrainians, according to a December Gallup poll, um, believe that corruption is widespread in Ukraine, but only 5% of Ukrainians believe that the authorities are doing something to fight it. Two-thirds of Ukrainians think the country is moving in the wrong direction, despite the foreign policy aspects. But let's remember that in every country, Canada, Britain, America included, um, foreign policy is usually the domain of the elites. You know, most voters don't really follow foreign policy issues. And they don't vote on foreign policy questions. They vote on bread and butter issues. Um, it's that what affects them. It's the chattering classes. It's the intellectuals, the think tankers, the journalists who follow foreign policy issues. It's not, and of course, the Ukrainian community. But, but that's different. That's unusual um, because Ukraine's in a state of war. But we have, think about it, Ukrainians are in a deep economic recession. 
They're suffering the pains of economic, social and fiscal reforms demanded by the IMF EU. Yes, those reforms have been long overdue. Every government, both pro-Western and pro-Russian, has postponed them. They're long overdue. Ukraine needs those. Um, you can't go on only charging your households 20% of the, of the, of the cost of the gas imported from Russia. Um, it's simply not, it's not good economics. Um, so Ukraines are suffering from the unpopular reforms, but they're not getting the good reforms. They're not getting the feel-good factor of high-level guys, oligarchs, and Yanukovych's cronies going to jail. They're getting the opposite. These guys have been allowed to flee the country. You know, Berkut officers, some of which are still working in the Interior Ministry, Others were pre-warned and told to flee. Some were allowed to uh, leave the courtrooms um, and go into uh, household detention, and then they went and hid themselves, so they're not allowed, not around anymore. Um, important names like um, uh, former Yanukovych cronies, um, like Sergei Kluyev was allowed to, his immunity was stripped by Parliament, then he was allowed to flee the country. Others were given immunity a long time ago, such as Mitro Firtash, Sergei Lovochkin, and Yuri Boyko. Um, a Ukrainian parliamentary um, request to have Boyko's immunity lifted has been sitting in the Ukrainian parliament since July because the prosecutor's office is blocking it. And the prosecutor's office only does that if President Poroshenko tells it to. So Ukrainians are no, no, not surprisingly disillusioned at a time when they have to you know, it's the little guys that have to go through the unpopular reforms and tighten their belts. And in any country, if utility bills went up so much, we would be pretty angry. But they're not getting the other side of the reforms, the good reforms, the rule of law, corruption, um, getting, getting the old guys from the previous regime in jail. They're not getting any of that. Um, and that's because uh, President Poroshenko simply doesn't have the political will. He's afraid that if he goes after these people, it will open up a Pandora's box that will shed light on maybe his past as well. Remember, he's been involved in business affairs for 20 years in Ukraine, and he was a founder of the Party of Regions. He's a major flip-flopper. He's gone from pro-Russian to the pro-Western camp on many occasions. Prior to the Orange Revolution, he was part of the Yanukovych camp. Then he went to Yushchenko. He headed his campaign. Um, Prior, prior to the Euromaidan, he was a member of the Azarov government. Then he went to the Euromaidan. So he's not willing to go after those people that were his former allies or, or who are today his current business allies. It's as simple as that. Um, he doesn't have the political will to do, do that. He's not afraid. I did suggest to people in the presidential administration that, the, that Poroshenko should do a press conference and say publicly that I want to be the first to be illustrated in Ukraine. And that would have been a major breakthrough in Ukraine. It would show that I have nothing to hide. You know, things happened in the past, sure. But, you know, this was the way business was done in under Kuchma or whatever. But I got the answer back from the presidential administration that do you think we're kamikaze pilots to suggest something like that to President Poroshenko? Um, the other factor which is coming increasingly, making him increasingly similar to Yushchenko and it's part of this Soviet culture, is this arrogance and narcissism of Ukraine's elites. They still are so full of themselves that they don't want to listen to the Ukrainian public. Poroshenko tells people, and he said this um, in the last few months to a gathering where there were some Ukrainian Canadians um, president, and he said to them that I'm the best president Ukraine's ever had or will ever have. Now, somebody who says that is extremely arrogant and doesn't really understand the public mentality out there. Um, and he's therefore not a listening president, just as Yushchenko wasn't a listening president. He has to listen to the vibes on the street, what's happening out there. Um, he has to listen to the fact that Ukrainians are demanding in the Orange Revolution and in the Revolution of Dignity, the Euromaidan, justice. and um, dignity to be treated as human beings and citizens and that I think will be Poroshenko's downfall I predict that he 
will not finish his entire period in office. He will not um, do more than one term in office. Um, and he has to be very careful. Because if he provokes, if he continues to do nothing in this field of corruption and bringing to justice people from the former regime, people who murdered the Heavenly Hundred, then he could bring uh, violent conflict against himself. This is a prediction made by one of Ukraine's most foremost and influential sociologists, Irina Bekeshkina, from Democratic Initiatives. She said in December that if there are not radical reforms and the pursuit of corruption in Ukraine, then the authorities will be overthrown. Those were her views, because of the growing radicalization and disenchantment of the population. She said also that if that happens, then it could also damage Ukraine as, a, as an independent sovereign country, because this is something that Putin would, of course, uh, use to his advantage. So ironically, we have this very fortuitous international environment for Ukraine's breakthrough from Russia's su suffocating embrace towards Europe, and then we have a president who simply is not up to the, up to the task. He's, he's becoming more and more like Yushchenko, and he simply doesn't understand what happened on the Euromaidan and how Ukrainians have changed. Ukrainians will not just take it as they did after the Orange Revolution and just accept that Yushchenko is bad and then not do anything about it. Today, we have a different situation. Ukrainian civil society has not gone home after the Euromaidan. It, after the Orange Revolution, it went home. After the Euromaidan, it has not gone home. We have a lot of uh, veterans from the war. There's a lot of guns around. And we have people who are angry, who have lost their beloved, either on the war or on the Euromaidan, and they will simply not allow Poroshenko just steal the Euromaidan from them. So I think that is the main danger I see for Ukraine in 2016, is that Ukraine's leaders yet again are not up to the task, that Ukraine's population is more politically mature than Ukraine's elites and are more European than Ukraine's elites, um, who are just interested really in the finer points of making money. After all, um, of Ukraine's top 10 wealthiest businessmen, oligarchs, only one has improved his standing in the last two years, and that's Poroshenko. He's moved up from ninth out of 10 to 6th out of 10 in the size of his assets. And this is somebody who promised to sell his business when he came to power. All of this will work against him. Um, Ukrainians will not forget these things. So he's living in a dream world if he thinks he can somehow wing it and be re-elected again. Um, that's the tragedy um, of, of, of Ukraine. The good signs are there, but I am not sure that Ukraine's ruling elites really have it in them to rise to the, to the occasion. Um, but we hope that things will change for the better, that they will come to their senses. Um, I mean, Western politicians such as U.S. Vice President Joe Biden was in Kiev. He made the same kind of warnings I made um, to Ukraine's, Ukraine's leaders that you can't again mess up as you did after the Orange Revolution. It's not good for you. It's something now, you know, you could mess up then. Putin was a different person. Today, Putin would take advantage of that. So let's hope that uh, these predictions don't turn out to be the case and that Ukraine's elites do rise up to the occasion and therefore that in August of this year we are celebrating a new Ukraine arriving on the European scene. Vesely van Sjat and Happy New Year.